here we I'm go just home so if i like pop in and out i'm still listening i just i'm getting settled <laughs> no problem no problem hi everyone welcome to our uh connected kinesiologist monday meetup for monday may 17th my birthday uh, i want to welcome all of you this evening we're going to be talking about record keeping this evening and as always, um, I'll introduce myself briefly as the co-administrator of the Connected Kinesiologist Group. And I'm the founder of First Line Education. We're a company that upskills um, kinesiologists to bridge the gap between college or university and professional practice. So I'm going to give everyone a chance to say hi and introduce themselves because part of being live in this meeting is the chance to network and to get to know everybody in the group. And uh, that always has some really great side benefits as well. So this evening we do uh, luckily have a special guest with us, Zana Ouellette. Um, Zana, do you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. So I am a practicing kinesiologist in Windsor, Ontario. I've been a kinesiologist for about two and a half years. I'm also a member of the college's quality assurance committee and um, specifically with uh, record keeping. Kind of lucky, kind of worked out well. So I'll turn it over to Katie to say hello. Hi, uh, I'm Katie. I am in Brantford, Ontario. Um, and I uh, have my own business called Achieving Motion. And I work specifically with seniors and those with neurological conditions. Um, using exercise to improve their independence, prevent falls, um, things like that. And uh, brain activities as well, I like to throw in. <laughs> great, great. It's a, it's a really good area to practice and you'll have a lot of longev longevity there for sure. Emma, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, so I'm Emma, I live in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm looking to write the test when it comes available. Uh, I'm looking in like the seniors fitness aquatherapy realm when I graduate, when I get my test. When you hit the next stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. the next stage Great. Yeah. Very, very good. Jennifer, hello. Hi, I'm Jennifer and I am tuning in from Ottawa, Ontario. I'm a registered kinesiologist and I've been training more um, through personal training, one-on-one -on -one clients, and that's been since 2008. Um, I've also done some work working um, with a physiotherapy at their clinic and really bridging the gap with more um, movement, neurological, um, yeah, really teaching body awareness and how to really get in tune with proprioception and what's best for the client um, in that sense. So after an acute um, injury, um, really how to move more freely and build strength and, and all of that. So, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Well, I thought we might kick off this evening's discussion with just chatting about why record keeping is important. So what are some of your thoughts about why should we even keep notes about our clients in the first place? What could be some of the, the reasons why we might wanna do that? Yep, liability reasons. So just to make sure that we are keeping our clients safe and uh, that we have a, a path to, to follow in terms of um, talking about what we're doing with them. Yep, and documenting their progress session to session and, and also looking at that overall plan uh, thank you, Jennifer. So we're looking at the direction that the client's going in and whether what we have in mind matches what their goals are, and how closely those are connecting. Any other thoughts? For communication within a multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this way, uh, everybody who would have access to that chart um, would be able to see what you're doing with the client. And then if you had to pass that client, like Jennifer working with a physiotherapist in her practice, that way that the, the transfers within would be pretty seamless. And Jennifer mentions here as well that accountability and transferability. So that transferability was what we were just talking about. And then accountability would be accountability to um, your client 
and then also accountability to whom else would you need to be accountable to are you thinking like the college as well yeah so like you, yeah and also yourself so like you know what your your plan is going mm -hmm. forward and also the client because you want to know or they want to know like what you have in store for them type of thing or what you're planning on doing because mm -hmm. they might not remember what they've done but as long as you have that um like plan in place like this is what we've, we've done you know last week this is what we're doing this week type of thing so they know that you actually know what you're doing yeah exactly and then you need yeah. also need accountability to your funding sources showing what you're doing is making a difference there's a reason for them to pay you mm -hmm. yeah so you would need accountability to either the client themselves if they're paying privately or um, workers safety and insurance board work safe bc if you're out in the west side um an auto insurer um extended health care um benefits group perhaps you may also need accountability uh, we mentioned to the client themselves where you want to make sure that what you're doing is driving with their goals that they have too any other thoughts on why you might want to keep client notes you might need to compare session by session with your financial records to say the, this is how many treatment sessions we had this month, and I can match that to the invoice that I gave to the client or match that to the invoice that I completed for the payer. Um, and so that way you can trace, here's how many sessions are in the notes, here's how many sessions connected to the invoice, and, and then there's a match there so that you are making sure that you are properly getting paid for your services and that the client is also appropriately paying you for the amount of services that you're providing as well. Any other thoughts about why we might want to do this in general? If you think about it, when we are writing, when we are actually in the process of keeping track of our client's progress, we're also keeping track of our thought process. And we're thinking about what direction we are going in based on the initial assessment that we've done with the client. So we are walking through a path of clinical reasoning, of making some decisions about where we're going to start with that client. Is there any information missing? Do we need to be consulting with other healthcare providers? Is there anything else that would help us see this client's picture more clearly? And then we can put into those places that step-by-step -step journey to working more toward uh, a treatment plan and uh, using the client's input as well, um, getting that path for future treatment. And so I think that's an area we can, we can talk about a little later. One of the things that I notice in the courses that I teach is this is a big challenge for a lot of healthcare professionals, not just kinesiologists, but that clinical reasoning piece. So actually looking at that um, client record or that, that client chart as a journey and as a way of thinking and getting your thoughts down on paper or on your electronic device to map out what you want to be doing. So you can actually do some decision-making and you can actually do some um, clinical thought processes in real time as you're reflecting and going through the, the session notes, um, session by session. So any other thoughts about why we might wanna keep client notes to begin with? If we hit on a lot of the major things, um, we want to also make sure that we're hitting upon um, any organizations that we're working with, any of their standards for client records. So if we, we talked about payers and, and what they may need to see, we talked about um, documenting perhaps what the client might need to see. We're talking about what other healthcare professionals might find interesting, could be a family physician, could be another person that becomes involved in the care of that client. So we're thinking about what are all the different audiences that we're writing to that could possibly gain access to the chart notes and have a look at our decision-making process. So that map 
someone needs to be able to clearly follow and make sure that they can follow where our decisions are coming from and where we're headed to. So we have to kind of consider all of that when we're, we're putting those notes down on paper. So Zana, when you're working with people in your quality assurance role, can you mention some of the, the bigger things that pop up um, when the kinesiologist charts are reviewed by the college? What are some of the, the comments and the concerns that you might see commonly? Absolutely. So one of the biggest things is that regardless of what role you're working in, you always have an obligation to document as a kinesiologist because that you do have that registration. So even if you're working in a PTA role or a personal trainer role, you still are accountable to the college for the care you're providing. So even if you know your physiotherapist says, oh, it's fine, you're working under me, you still have that accountability to the college. For every patient that you see, you need to have documentation on exactly what Angela was talking about, your thoughts, your reasonings, because we are regulated professionals, we do have obligations, and it's not just enough to say someone told me to do it, so I did it. That's really interesting. So as kins, we actually have autonomy within a client record so that we would have to mention a directive if we'd been given one and who it was being given by and exactly what that directive was. And then also collaboratively, if it wasn't a directive, and if it was a collaborative treatment plan and we were documenting our piece, that is very interesting that in that client uh, record, there may be a physician's note, there may be a physio note, a kin note, an OT note, massage therapist note, and it becomes this collective kind of living document that everyone contributes to. So even though we're being supervised by another healthcare professional because they are directing the treatment plan, we are autonomous in that way and, and must need to sign off on our, our notes. Yeah, so thanks for clarifying that. That's a big question. <laughs> I like the cat's tail. <laughs> so, some of the other things are that if your note is not made the date you saw the client, you need to put in why that is. It's expected that you're documenting in a timely manner. And if you're not, there needs to be something like late note due to time constraints enter on this date for the session that occurred on this day because whenever we see an entry in a chart that's not made the same day as your appointment it raises a red flag because a lot of times you get people they're like oh I do all my documentation Friday afternoon that's not really a good practice mm -hmm. um, you know you're not having the the thought and the freshness of the information if you're not documenting the same day so I've often found and recommended to people and, and maybe anyone else here can chime in that I would reserve an hour at the end of my day just to actually sit quietly and say, okay, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, what happened with each client? So I might take some quick notes as I go from client to client, um, but then there's some time to go and backfill that information. So would that be acceptable, Zana, that we're actually going back at the end of the day and filling in? Yeah, any of the gaps yeah really that it's looking for a different day a lot of emrs if you use an emr mm -hmm. time stamp whenever you put something in it everything is time stamped and so ah. it's gonna see if you edited it if you changed it when you put it in and those time stamps show up when you give the college like the big stacked printout of your charts right 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 so emr electronic medical record and then do you know of any particular systems that you often see at the college? Are so there are some common ones that you find kinesiologists tend to use? I don't think I've ever seen the same one twice. There's really? Oh, a interesting. Lot of different ones. Okay. Um, it really depends on where the person's working, what they've mm -hmm. found best for them. Mm -hmm. um, I've even seen people that just like keep a running Google Doc for each client. Is that uh, acceptable? If it has all of the elements to it, yes, but you need to okay. make sure that everything is included so that you have some way to sign off on that. You're having dates and times of your sessions, some mm -hmm. kind of record of your financial dealings, and it puts a lot more on you as a clinician to remember to add it all in. Right, so that might be an interesting place to go next. 
what needs to be in a client record. So let's just riff as we did before. We talked about why we keep client records. Now let's just brainstorm. What are some of the things in no particular order that you want to make sure make it into that, uh, that client chart? What do you think? Like the name of the, name of the client, um, like the, the service provided, mm -hmm. the client, um, like the name of the provider. Um, hold on, yeah. no. Good I'll start. Yeah. Nope. Good start. What else have we got? Any other ideas? So we'd want a uh, signed consent from the client in there as well. Um, date of birth, I'm not sure if you mentioned date of birth, Emma. So date of birth needs to be in there. Um, and then their particulars, their address, their telephone number. Um, uh, yeah, a client identifier. So um, Katie, do you mean like a, a client number perhaps or some other unique way of identifying who they are? Yeah, so I think in the college guidelines, it says every client needs like a unique um, identification. So like a health card number or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Santa, what might you suggest in terms of a unique identifier for a client? What have you seen? So you need two unique identifiers on every piece of paperwork in that person's chart. So uh -huh. the good ways to do it, name is always number one. And mm -hmm. then um, date of birth, health mm -hmm. card number gets a little bit iffy because there is some legislation about health card number um, privacy in Ontario. And if you're right. going to be having that paperwork around with you or your computer isn't locked all the time, you can get into some sticky areas with that. Mm -hmm. And clients also don't have to provide you with their health card number unless you are an OHIP billing service, just because of the importance of confidentiality around the Ontario health card number. So mm -hmm. it's better to use, um, if they're coming from a third party funder, use their number for that. So their auto insurance claim number, their WCB claim number. Some people um, create their own and they start with 2020 or 2021 and they give first client as client number one, the next client's client number two. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that you can pick that you're gonna be able to like increase so that once you get more than like three clients, you have a way to continue working with that. Something that's easy for you to add on to and easy to manage. Yeah, um, I've done it both ways. I've done just name and date of birth, which is what I do now. Um, when I had a large clinic and there was a number of clinicians in there, uh, we just put stickers on the outside of the chart. So you're exactly right. We would have the last two digits of the year and then the beginning of my practice, it was 001 and we just climbed that way. And that's just how we did it. So, um, and you eventually got used to whose number was whose in the, in the, uh, the filing cabinet. So we were, it was easy to grab. Um, so those, those would be um, easy ways of doing it. And I, I would agree, not that I have a choice, but I would agree with um, not necessarily putting the health card number because kinesiologists don't interact with the, um, the OHIP system um, or any provincially funded system if we're talking about across Canada. So it, it may not be the best unique identifier. Um, and then also the privacy um, protection, I would consider to be really important. Yeah, thank you for those suggestions because I I don't I don't personally use the health card number. I think that was just one that I had, like someone had given me an example in the past. Sure. Um, I don't use it because I don't I don't really like to ask for it, kind of for those reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like I was at times kind of stuck for like what else to use. So I appreciate yeah. the ideas. Yeah, no problem. And um, Zana, I would think as long as you had something, meaning as long as a clinician had something that made sense and something that was in fact unique, that's why the college guideline is broad. It, it has to be something that works for you in your system, but that you could demonstrate was unique to that particular client. So there's a lot of variability there. You have a lot of opportunity and choice available to you. Yeah, they don't prescribe what you need to pick. You have mm -hmm. the choice to pick whatever unique identifier works for you. Right, no, that's great. What other things do we want in that chart? What would you think? It's just, just some basic things. Uh, with one of the um, softwares, the Jane app, 
Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've heard of that one, but that also assigns like a number to the client, like a client number. So I feel like, would that be an acceptable, um, you know, identifier? Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, some of them do have automatic numbers. Some of them you can set up your own identifier systems in. And it could be something that's unique to the clinic, or it could be something that's unique across a, a bunch of different clinics or across providers. You've got a way of communicating about um, how you're setting up your clients across different practices too. That could work. So other things that you might typically expect. And what we tended to do in, in our company when I was working with a large number of kids is um, we were pay for charting back in the day. And these would be things that you'd open the chart. And on the left side of the chart, we would have just an overview page so that um, you could always quickly reference all the basic things you needed to know about the client. So what are some other things that you might see in that kind of quick reference overview? That would make sense a working diagnosis or a diagnosis that's been given by a professional that can communicate one. Mm -hmm. Right, so you would have um, that coming from another professional or it could be your own clinical impression or you, what you think would be the root cause of, of, what that clin of what that client was demonstrating. Yep, mm -hmm. that would be good. Precautions to work thoughts? with the client. So someone who mm -hmm. has an allergy to latex or someone who faints. Yeah, maybe someone who has a pacemaker, someone who has a colostomy bag, maybe someone who has a pick line, any of those high, high level precautions you'd want to be very aware of. Anything unique about that client that you, if you were passing that client note, uh, that client chart onto another provider, you'd, you'd really want to make sure that they they saw these features um, on the inside cover or highlighted in the chart at some point. Any other thoughts? There's still a few more I would consider. What about medications? So, and I would also consider supplements as well. So medications and supplements I think should be featured there quite prominently. You may also put uh, where the referral came from. From a business standpoint, it's always good to know where your clients are coming from because you wanna double back and thank whoever is referring to you. But also you wanna look at trends too, to say what kinds of clients are finding me, where are they coming from? And you can use these records as a form of marketing to say, wow, I didn't realize I was getting so many clients from this physician. Uh, let me go and learn a bit more about why that's happening. Or I need to double back and say, hey, thanks. You know, I'm really noticing as I review my client files that you're sending me a lot of business and I appreciate that. Thanks very much. And how might I make this um, process smoother for you? Is there any other information I can provide to help your, your patients or to help you refer more people toward me? Anything else you can think of? Still more. What about uh, a listing of any other current healthcare practitioner that that person is seeing? So maybe there's a naturopath in there. Maybe they see um, an acupuncturist, maybe a massage therapist. Um, maybe they're working with uh, a Reiki healer. Um, any other practitioner that they're interacting with, I think um, should be documented there because you may need to communicate um, any changes in condition. You may also need to talk to them about changing their approach with the client slightly as you are moving through your treatment plan. So the other thing that dovetails with your informed consent is that if you need to talk to another healthcare practitioner about your client, you need another consent form on top of that. So you need a clear consent form saying, that um, you have the client's permission and the client gives you their permission to talk about these specific things, not the whole chart, but these specific things with that other healthcare provider. So you and the client complete this form, that form goes to the other healthcare provider, they acknowledge that they received the form 
And then you arrange a time to communicate, but you only stick to exactly what you talked about ahead of time and had um, approved by the client uh, what you were going to be discussing. So that could be another form that would be appearing in the chart because you'd have a record that you communicated with other people about the client's condition. What about an injury history? So I know that's part of your, your general health history, but you also may say, you know, this is the third time that they have a second degree sprain of the right ankle. So maybe there's some highlights of surgeries, um, injuries, recurring injuries, um, things that um, you think, you know, these are some high points that I think need to be considered and we have to keep an eye on um, a, a history of back surgery, uh, a knee replacement. These are things that you might quickly want to flag and just have available. And you also want to highlight what their primary concern or complaint is. Because as you're going through your critical thinking, your client came to you saying, my back is really, really sore. And you do your postural evaluation and you take a look at them and you think, let's take a look at the shoulder. Because I'm not sure, I, I hear you that your back is, is a problem, but I actually want to take a look at the shoulder and see if that's contributing to your back pain. But you're noting that their primary complaint, their primary concern was they came into you because of left-sided lower back pain. So you're always being very careful to make sure that the, the client's um, needs are heard. So that would be another thing to, to make sure you have there. So we have previous injuries, previous surgeries. We have talking about any other healthcare practitioners that they're currently working with. Um, we have medications. We have any consent forms that need to be in that chart. We have um, all of their, their basic personal information so that you've got name, date of birth, address, occupation, uh, maybe how they're paying you. Maybe you have um, a signed cancellation policy in there. Um, that's kind of the, the laundry list. Did I miss anything, Santa? Is there anything else? Contact can be helpful too. Excellent. Yes, thank you. An emergency contact. So who might that emergency contact be? And how would you document that in the, in the file? So if you think logistically, the emergency contact would be someone that could be easily reached and that you would have a, a cell number uh, where you could either text that person and you document you're phoning them or you're texting them. What is the best way of contacting them and how are you contacting them? And then also you want to make sure that that person is available. So you may put down a close family member but they are usually occupied in meetings and don't respond to their phone during these times. So you have to logistically talk that through with the client to say, during the time I'm with you, who is your emergency contact? So I need to make sure that we can contact someone that would be available between four and five on a Monday when we're together. Just talking from experience <laughs> a few times where you're like, oh my gosh, your son is not answering his phone. Oh yeah, he's usually out of the office at this time. What? So that's also thinking through your experience with your client and keeping your client safe and you safe by extension. That would be something I would just carefully consider. Okay. So any other questions popping up for you? At this point, Zana, is there anything else that we should touch upon in terms of the very basics that need to be in those client records? Um, maybe a little bit about discharges. Are, are you going to get to that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what might you recommend? What might you suggest in terms of how you're actually charting at the end of your interactions with a client? 
So regardless of why you discharge a client, whether they stop showing up or they um, like can't afford to come to treatment anymore or you're discharging them because they've completed a treatment plan, you need some kind of formalized final note. That's something that's missing in a lot of charts. People just mm. say, you know, plan complete discharge, but you need to have clearly in there, you know, what you've told the person. Have you told them they could return if their symptoms improve or um, worsen? What symptoms are they looking for? What are the red flags you advised them about? Um, there's a whole standard from the college about discharging a patient. And I feel like that often kind of falls to the wayside because it's not clinical care. It's what happens after the clinical care and it gets forgotten. That's a really good point. And a lot of times you feel like, Whew, I can close the chart. I can just file it away. And I haven't actually mentioned what did that last session look like? What did I provide them in terms of next steps? Um, did I leave that window open clearly for them to return to me? Or did I refer them on to someone else? And um, then how do I actually document that and sign off saying clearly this was my last session? with a client, yeah. So some of the uncomfortable entries that I've had to make because of my client population is a client has died. And I actually have to say treatment ended because they're not here anymore. And so I've actually written down, here's what happened of course at our, at our last session, but then here's how I learned about the client's death Here's actually any next steps with the family because sometimes the family has requested um, something about the client file. So they either want a copy of it or uh, they're just coming, getting back to me to say, now, what do you do with mom's file? Do we take it? Do you hang on to it? So I also follow up with the family, um, not only about attending the funeral or the Shiva or whatever happens at that point, but then also to gently say, I've got your mom or your dad's or your brother's medical record. And here's what I typically do as per our college um, uh, instructions. So I just wanted to let you know that this chart will remain with me. How long does that client chart remain with me? Specifically when a client passes away, we'll, we'll continue with that theme. What are your thoughts? 10 years? Yes, Emma, it's been studying 10 years. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was ready in April, so I'm ready. You're <laughs> ready. Exactly. Exactly. You're ready. Good for you. So 10 years. Now that's if a client passes away. What happens if um, you just discharge a client and you clearly state, here's the next steps that I've instructed this client to, to follow? How long does a client chart get saved in that case? Trick question. I'm not still 10 years? Yeah. 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> if a client is younger than 18 and you discharge them, how long are you keeping that chart in your possession for? 10 years from their 18th birthday. You got it. You got it. Exactly. And so what do we do with this chart? Where do we keep it? How is it protected? What are we actually doing with this? So let's say it's a, let's say it's a paper chart for now. What do we do with that paperwork? Any thoughts? So for me, um, I have transferred my notes from, um, yeah, filed in a safe place, exactly. So I have paper notes that I then transferred to using my iPad and then transferred again. I'm exploring using Jane, um, talking about Clinic Master, talking about Embodia, what are all the different groups? So I'm bouncing between a couple at the moment. So the previous, and, and I've worked with clients for 13, 15 years. So there's files. So I've got all the back files in a fireproof um, box that's locked and it's anchored to a wall so that I'm, that record is not going anywhere. And it's reasonably protected in my home office if there was a fire. 
So I've, I've gone to as many lengths as I can to protect those notes. Um, and so then any of the client notes that I use in a very common and a very regular basis are just in the front of, of that uh, save. So it's easily able to, to file them away every evening. And when I have stopped working with the client and I've discharged them and they hit the 10 year mark, what do you suggest I do with the file? Any ideas at that point? So I don't need the file anymore. So what I do is, sorry, Emma, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say you could probably shred it would be a, a better option than just like throwing it out. Yeah, you would need to. Like confidential information. Exactly. So you'd need to shred it and preferably with a cross cut yeah. shredder, not just a ribbon type of shredder. And so what I do is um, I box it up, seal the box, and actually take it to a shredded center. Um, um, because depending upon the year, I've got quite a number of them. So I take it to a shredded center, and I get to watch that box. And I watch the box from, they take it from my car, put it into a bin, and then they give me a certificate of destruction so that I've seen the chart go into their system. And they say, okay, we accepted this box on this date. And then I keep that certificate to say, here are all the client files I took to the shredded company. And I do have the person sign off that accepted the box from me. And I know that they'll be destroyed on this date. So I just follow that through. And so um, you don't have to take it to a shredded center. Uh, my practice used to be bigger, so now I, I just have the single charts if I hit the 10. Well, I still do have um, quite a few from 10 years ago, but moving forward, I don't have as many clients, so I'll just feed them carefully through a crosscut shredder at the 10-year mark. But I would also um, document carefully the day that client file was destroyed and how it was done. So just to make sure that it's all documented. <laughs> So what are some other ways that you might consider storing your charts? Um, we, we mentioned in a safe place and locking it up. So let's expand on that a little bit. So you could have, let's say, um, just a two drawer filing cabinet that you can put them in um, with, a, with a lock and key. Um, you could have a fireproof, um, box that you keep them in. Um, but those would be the recommendations. It has to actually be put away in a place where someone walking into your home office or walking by your desk uh, wouldn't be able to see your, your client notes. What about transporting client files? If you're still keeping um, paper notes, what are some things to consider when you're moving between clients during your day? Let's say in my case, I'm traveling from home to home. What are some things to consider? Make one of those lock um, like filing, like handle ones you can like carry around that have a lock on you it. Could. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. If it's on your person at all times, I'm not sure that it has to be locked what would you say about that Santa I think if it's during the day it wouldn't have to be locked but at yeah, the end of the day you know like a reasonable expectation if you're moving from client's house to client's house mm -hmm. is it safer to leave something locked in your trunk than to bring it into a different client's home so yeah that's a really that's a really good idea yeah when I was um riding my bike between clients and client I'd be really careful that the bag I was using I could open the bag without people seeing client names on my charts. So I, there was a separate zippered section. And what I could do was I could take out the current clients, uh, like my next client, and I'd slide in my current clients, zip it closed, and pull the next clients out into the front section. And so that way, when I open my bag, then it was just the current client's chart that was seen. Um, and so uh, 
there's been times when you realize, oh, just a second, and you zip open the other section, and then you realize, whoa, they could see everyone else in the neighborhood, <laughs> and a lot of them know each other. And, you know, so you realize just how confidential you have to keep all of that information. What about working in a clinic where there's a lot of activity around a front desk area? What are some suggestions? So I used to work in a physiotherapy center where uh, actually two different physiotherapy centers where they would pull all the client charts for the day. And so what we had to make sure of is that they weren't visible from the reception area. And so they were uh, in a place where all of the clinicians could get at the charts, but any of the patients or clients couldn't get at the charts and also that they weren't visible. So that's why you'll see in some clinics, the identifiers are numbers or the first three letters of a client's last name perhaps, um, but you didn't have first and last names visible at all. So you're again, taking a reasonable precaution to keep your client's identities uh, confidential there. So what about electronically? Now I open my, uh, flip my iPad open and I have to make sure I've, cl I've closed the client note from the session before. Because if I'm sitting right beside my client, I open my iPad, whoop, there's someone else's information there. So I'm making sure that I close the note, put it away, and that there's some sort of um, screen or a template that uh, doesn't have any confidential information on it. And then there's no listing. Some of the EMRs have a listing of all your clients, and you have to make sure that's also hidden, just in case you step away from your iPad or your laptop and your client happens to be close to it. I found one of the worst things too when I'm trying to book clients and they're looking over my shoulder at my calendar. Yeah. That's got everybody's <laughs> on it. It's like, no, I just, can you just stand over there and I'll tell you the times. Like we can't look at the calendar together. Exactly. So uh, one of the things that we were doing as a company is, is just not even putting the client's last names because they're like, oh, so you know, and you're like, oh my gosh. So you, you can't even put a last name. So you could put just a first name and maybe a last initial if you had two people with the same names. But these are all the things to think about, right, Zana, where you could flip open a laptop, flip open a computer, go onto your phone and picture your client always over your shoulder and think, if this was my information or my client's information, how could I keep it as confidential as possible? Absolutely, and as a person with a unique name, I worry that even if someone's just using my first name, everybody's gonna know who I am because there's no one else in my city with my name. You are famous, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and my name is incredibly common, incredibly common. In Toronto, there's probably 40 or 50 Angela Pereiras. And then there's even people with my middle name, which is crazy. My middle name is Maureen. So I have an Italian, Portuguese, Angela Pereira, and then throw the Irish in, who combines those? So yeah, a very, very common um, name. But you're right, if your client has a unique name or if you have a client who's very well connected and, and knows a lot of people in the area that you work in, or in my case, I work with multiple family members and they don't know that I work with family members and they've they've never asked and I've never told um, but a grandmother doesn't know I see three of her grandchildren and the grandchildren unless they talk their cousins they don't know so it's things you have to think about <laughs> so anything else in terms of file storage or um, file destruction, or even that last entry into a client file, whether someone's passed away or whether you're discharging the client or referring that client on to another healthcare pro, that last directive has to be very clear. 
what about sharing your chart notes? What about a family member saying, would you mind if I took a look at what you wrote for the last session for my son, for my mother? How would you manage that situation? Could you just say, oh, sure, yeah, no problem. Here, let me show you what we wrote down. And that could be just like an exercise record, or it could be actually written your thoughts. It could be written analysis of, of your upcoming session or your current session. How would you address something like that? Any ideas? And no two situations are gonna be alike. I can promise you that. <laughs> I mean, I think the first thing you need to do is look at your consents and your capacity. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain the difference between those? Sure. So with your consent, that's where you have documentation allowing you to share that. So that could be on the same form where you're talking about sharing information with another provider. They could also have given you permission to share with their family. Right. And that's a good point, actually coming into capacity. So are we talking about a six-year-old and the mom wants to peek at the chart? Because with that, you know, that is allowed. There isn't an age for healthcare consent in Ontario. And so that does put a lot of the onus on you as a clinician to make that decision and decide if you're willing to share that chart. And if that individual rep, whether they're six or 16 is open to that. And then coming on the other end, when you're working with older people or people with brain injuries, some of those people don't have the capacity to make healthcare decisions and they're made by a substitute decision maker. And that could be a family member, it could be a member of the capacity board that's been appointed. And those people do have the right to look at those notes because you would treat them as if they were the decision maker and the patient. Right, right. So very, very good points there, really good points. So um, the first point you made was, what if that person is a minor child? And so who is the decision maker, the guardian, the parent, the caregiver who has authority, for lack of a better word, um, over top of that, that child? So that would be definitely something to consider when you're actually doing that health history with the client on their first visit is who does make decisions for this person? Uh, and making sure that they are signing off and you have agreement on, on what's happening there. And then the second point, yes, what happens if there's a learning disability, if there is um, someone who is mentally incapacitated in some way, what happens if their mental health changes while you're working with them? And all of a sudden, you know that they have a legal power of attorney, do they have a health power of attorney as well? And so those may be different people too. So having that open conversation to say, I know that there's some, some health changes happening here slowly, quickly. How would you like me to, to work with you and, and work with the client in terms of um, sharing the information in the, the client file and, and talking about next steps in terms of treatment and progress checkup checkups? So those are conversations that... Um, I've had many times with clients um, and it's not an easy conversation to sit down with adult children to say your clients, your, your, your mom or your dad is no longer able to give me the feedback that she was three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So I now need to keep you up to date, I feel, on how they're doing because the caregivers now, I'm gonna need more interaction with the personal support workers or whomever that might be. There's gonna be a little more give and take about how are they doing because they can't report now anymore about how things are going. So it gets tricky and complicated and very interesting. Anything else we should add to that, Zana? No? So I have a client at the moment who's 66. And his daughter, who is in her early 30s, is paying for his treatment. She feels she has the ability to ask me questions about her father's care. How would I manage that situation? What would you think? Interesting, right? It's not always black and white. So can I report to daughter about how dad's doing? No. 
so she'll regularly call me or send me text messages. How was dad today? Oh, he was great. We had a nice session. Yep. And, you know, we, we spent some time in the sun. Can't tell her what we're doing. Um, can't talk about any suggestions or recommendations that I'm giving him. Can't talk about any conversations that I've had with his family physician. Um, nothing. That's, that's private, confidential information. But you can see how the roles get a little bit muddy, right? Um, depending upon who's paying. So also working with insurance companies, how much access do they have to client information? They're paying for the services. What's the agreement? And how are we actually reporting? And does the client understand clearly what information is going to be passed back and forth? So that has to be made very clear. Any comments to that, Zana, at all? No. Ah, thanks, Jennifer. I know you've got a client coming up. Yes, catch the recording. And yes, we do have a ton of different templates that we can offer. Um, and I think that um, we can talk about soap notes. So you can see that in the recording. We can talk about that next, client formatting. And whether it's different for clinical patients uh, versus personal training clients? It's a good question as well. So we'll talk about those and you can catch up with that later. Yeah, thanks, have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Bye for now. Okay. It was oh, so Thanks great. a lot. Meeting everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, chat soon. So I just realized the time and as usual, <laughs> blowing right up against eight o'clock. So meet discussions, right? There's a lot to cover here. And um, it's bigger than an hour. And I think maybe what we could do is have a part B where we actually talk about how to write your chart notes and look at the templates that we can use and also um, look at all the EMR options and figure out what do these different systems have that are similar, that are different? How might you be recording your notes? Um, do they have to be soap notes? I'll throw that question out before we finish up. Um, love part B, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've been kicking around a lot of different options um, to look at uh, my next steps as well. So, so this is great because I'll do the research and, and then we can, we can chat about it. So just quickly know your chart notes don't have to be in any particular soap note format. As long as you have a system that makes sense to you and it is very, very clear. And that if you think about someone else reading like the college or another healthcare professional reading through the notes, does it logically make sense? Is it very clear? Does it show that critical thinking piece? Is there a nice progression and flow to what you're writing? Because really your professionalism is quite judged as Zana would agree by that thought process. And that is your calling card that is your reference to how you're showing up professionally is how you actually document your clients um, progress with you anything you would like to add or any questions that you have from part a <laughs> i was wondering about if you're in a clinical or not a clinical setting but in a setting with like people that are personal trainers and you're the only one that's a kinesiologist. Like I know that you have to keep your records to whatever your college would be. Um, but like, if you're assisting on their records, like you have to make it so that that record, maybe of another client or something, was with within like your guidelines. Right, and uh, and it may be that simple where you have to follow your college's guidelines. Um, so that's what I would say, Zana, what would you say? You probably could both share um, progress notes, but you would definitely be bound by, by the yeah. clinical requirements we've spoken about this evening. Absolutely, you have to make sure that you're that any chart you're touching meets the requirements of the college. Because yeah. say that that client that you only saw one time makes a complaint suddenly their entire chart is going to the college. And if their chart was a personal training chart, but you 
we're still within it and working in it, that's going to come down on you for not making sure that that chart was complete. And is ah, it before? So it's like, is it before? Like, let's say you kind of come in the middle of their session, like they've been training since January, let's say, and you come in in May. Like, do you have to make sure that, or like, see, like at that point that like you came in in May, like from May onwards, it has to be. Yes, oh, you're only responsible go for the care you provide, unless you're delegating to that personal trainer. Um, so for example, in my workplace, we do a lot of verbal consults. So I'll ask another kin or I'll ask a physiotherapist, hey, I've got this case, what do you think? That means that they need to touch my chart. They need to have an entry in my chart just to cover both of us, that we did a verbal consult, we talked about this case because that's, you know, bringing another person into the circle of care. And that person is accountable to their college for the advice that they give me, just like I would be if I give advice to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question, Emma, because are we then responsible for the charting of the personal trainer, the record keeping of the personal trainer? What would you say, Zana? Is that something that we would then be concerned about is how the trainer is showing up in that in those notes? I would say no, because you're not signing off on their note. If you're co-signing right. their note, that is a concern. But if right. they're entering their own note, say you're in an EMR and it's under their provider ID, they're signing off on it. You're not expected to look over that person unless you're in that right. role. Mm -hmm. They are allowed to chart however they want. With personal trainers, I would say be careful that they're not using the abbreviation PT because a lot of them do. And if that shows up in a chart, people are going to get angry if colleges start looking at it. Because that right. means physiotherapist? Or what does, yeah. Yeah, it's it's protected term, just like kin. You can't call yourself a PT if you're a personal trainer, but I don't think most of them know that. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, this has been great. Thank you very much, Zana. I'd like to invite you to our part B and I'll let you know when that might be. <laughs> and I really appreciated this. Thanks very much. Very good conversation. And if any of you have any questions that you'd like us to follow up on in that part B, um, send me a note or we can drop it into the Connected Kins Facebook group so that we've got a running list of questions that we can make sure that we um, answer as we move to our next session. Thank you, Katie. Did you have any questions at all? Uh, I think I'll have more for part B. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.